It's Norm from Tested, and well, today's the day. It's the launch day for Valve's Steam Deck, uh, their handheld portable gaming PC that really is almost unlike any gaming PC that most people have been exposed to. It's kind of a big deal. And months after they announced it and pre-order started after a little bit of a delay, today at the end of February is its official launch day. We can finally talk about our experiences with it. Now, some people who are early in on those pre-orders should be getting emails so that they can start actually ordering them and having them ship very soon. There is a long backlog of pre-orders, uh, but I, along with about 100 other reviewers, have been very lucky enough to get uh, hands-on with production units that we've been testing for about the past two weeks or so. And so now we can finally talk about not only the hardware, which you may have heard about, but compatibility with PC games, with a bunch of other software, performance, as well as the software, this Steam Deck UI that they've made specifically for this form factor that will also be trickling out to replace Steam Big Picture mode and how you play Steam on uh, Steam OS, the Linux version of Steam, as well as on your desktop or laptop version of Steam. Now, there's so much to talk about, and there are going to be lots of reviews, plenty of places where you can find some very in-depth benchmarks and teardowns. Uh, what I'm going to hope to do today is give a sense of my experience playing the Steam Deck on how I've been using it as someone who plays PC games uh, primarily on a desktop PC um, and wants to spend more time playing games outside of my office. We'll be talking about the hardware, we'll be talking about the software, the kind of suite of accessories you can get for it, how it compares to other devices that it may compete against. And while it might look a lot like you know, a Nintendo Switch at first glance in terms of it being you know, a handheld gaming device, uh, how different it actually is from a traditional, what we think of as a traditional portable gaming device like a Nintendo Switch or like a PS Vita or what you know, the Game Boys of the world brought to us. So let's hunker down and get right into it. Now, in case you don't know what the Steam Deck is, uh, think of it just as it's a gaming PC. It's an x86-based computer put into a form factor that's completely self-contained. So inside this form factor right here has the hardware, has the brains, has the guts of what would be comparable to like a mid-range gaming laptop. It runs a custom AMD uh, processor, an APU, that's their CPU, GPU combo, as well as Valve's own designed uh, controller interface. And what makes this device possible, not only from a technical standpoint, but for Valve to even want to really, you know, uh, to develop this is a kind of a culmination of all the work they've done from things like the Steam controller, when they first developed that controller to play PC games on a, a gamepad-like ergonomic form factor, to the Steam machines. Those were those that attempt at having a set-top box that was a PC gaming device running Linux to compete with or to live alongside uh, traditional game consoles uh, to the hardware expertise um, that they went through in developing and making the Valve Index VR headset. All of the, the, the hardware kind of learnings kind of uh, have culminated in this device uh, alongside the software. So from the Linux-based Steam machines, uh, they worked on developing Proton. That's their compatibility layer that allows for traditional games that typically would only run on Windows to now seamlessly or as seamlessly as possible run on the Linux-based Steam OS. 
And that combined with the availability of what AMD is able to manufacture with their latest uh, Zen 2 CPU architecture and RDNA 2 graphics architecture has really achieved what Valve thinks and really is like a sweet spot uh, on both the software and the hardware side. So the goal of this, obviously from Valve's perspective, getting people to buy games on Steam and kind of promote PC gaming in general. But the goal of this from a performance standpoint is to have a device that can play the majority of modern PC games and definitely legacy PC games at a re reasonable performance target. So that would be this screen resolution at a 1280 by 800 resolution, essentially a 720p screen uh, at medium to high to even some cases uh, ultra settings at between a 30 and a 60 uh, frames per second target. This is a 60 hertz screen. And of course, in a portable form factor, so it can run it on a battery. They say between two and eight hours of use, really on high-end games, as we'll talk about, it's closer to two to three hours of use. And I think they've hit it. I mean, I don't wanna bury the lead too much. Uh, this is a really remarkable device. And it really, in many ways, feels too good to be true. Uh, the fact that I'm holding it and in a standalone device playing games that tr I would traditionally only think of being able to play on a big game console on my set-top entertainment center or on a gaming laptop or gaming desktop. I have that in the power of my hands and a 1.5 pound form factor without having necessarily to stream it over a local network or a cloud service. And the fact that they're able to make this device and sell it for at the base level $400, that's the most remarkable thing about it. That's what feels like it's too good to be true. But I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start off by talking about the hardware, the ergonomics, the controllers, what's inside, what's packed in here, and then we'll move on to the software. So first off, let's talk about the size and form factor. Uh, I mean, the Nintendo Switch feels like the obvious comparison. This is a OG Switch, the first non-OLED version, and yeah, it's a lot bigger. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, like I said, in terms of uh, the screen being in the center, a large screen surrounded by traditional gamepad controls, uh, but it's not only wider, taller, thicker, it's also structurally different. It has these nice grips on the left and right side uh, that I think are more ergonomically sound than the Joy-Cons that you get on the Switch. Even though it's a lot bigger and it is technically heavier, the Switch I think is under a pound uh, with the Joy-Cons like 0.9 pounds, this is a pound and a half, um, it doesn't weigh as much as it looks, if that makes sense. A uh, pound and a half is considerable for a handheld, uh, but because of how that weight is distributed on uh, the Steam Deck, uh, picking this up, the, it's mostly plastic, uh, it doesn't feel like, my at least my initial impressions when I used it, is it doesn't feel as heavy as I thought it would. Now it was the same uh, circumstances when I gave this to my housemates, my family to, to pick up. Yes, they, they looked at it, the first impressions were, wow, that's a big device. Uh, but when they picked it up, oh, that's not as big as I thought it'd be. And anchoring the, this whole form factor is of course this display, it's a seven inch, 1280 by 800 uh, LCD panel, it's an IPS panel, and it is a touchscreen, so you can interact with not only games, but the Steam Deck UI, just using uh, touch controls. Uh, and then on the left and right here are all of the physical gamepad controls. And that's where Valve really threw the kitchen sink here, and where there might be the most questions in terms of usability and ergonomics. I mean, you have your traditional D-pad, ABXY buttons, you have two joysticks in addition to uh, two touch pads, and then you got dual triggers on each side as well as dual paddles on the back as well. Valve really took their learnings from the Steam controller in wanting to not only have as much functionality but as much customization as possible. And holding this, 
uh, you know, it's different from, for example, your Xbox controller where the joysticks are kind of diagonal from each other. That ergonomically is felt really well. Uh, here, the joysticks are on a parallel plane. But for me, playing with the joysticks, it felt really, really comfortable. The standard distance between where I was gripping it on my palm and where my thumb landed on each of these joysticks I didn't have to stretch or reach. I had full range of motion and never felt like I was really ex overextending or overexerting my thumb. Uh, same with the D-pad and the ABXY buttons. I mean, one of the things it looks like is that it looks like these buttons, which are a tad smaller, at least in the ABXY buttons, than you'd find on your, you know, your Xbox controller, uh, bigger than they are on the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons, uh, but they really push far up to the corners. And one of the concerns was, is that too far of a reach? And I can say it absolutely is not. Again, very comfortable to put my thumbs on both the joysticks as well as uh, the D's pad and ABXY. Uh, the trigger buttons, very responsive. They are single action uh, triggers here, so it's not a two-stage action. Uh, but there is haptic feedback where if you reach a certain threshold, you do feel an extra little bit of haptic feedback to let you know that you've reached a second stage. Uh, so in the software, it can perform as a two-stage trigger, even though it's not mechanically so. Uh, the paddle buttons were the ones I use the least. I know they're going to be useful for racing games, or you can use them as shortcuts if you want to emulate, you know, macros on a keyboard, for example. Uh, but for me, the because of the way I was gripping it, um, and you kind of want to hit these with, you know, your middle finger and maybe your ring finger. This is where I felt like uh, the buttons were not as comfortable to press while also holding and gripping the controller. Uh, there are also these two touch pads, which are kind of the same and also a little different than the Steam controller touch pads. They're rounded corners, but more square than they are uh, circular, and they allow for simulated uh, cursor support. Uh, so in games like point and click adventures where you might have a cursor on screen or for menus for a lot of these games, PC games, uh, you could use this if you didn't want to use the touch screen, you could use uh, the touchpad on either side as a replacement for that mouse. And if you remember the Steam Controller touchpads, uh, Valve tried to develop those so they would be useful and playable for fast-paced you know, FPS games, playing a Quake 3 or, uh, or a Halo on your PC using a, a gamepad form factor that gave you as fast as you, uh, the responsiveness as you would have on a mouse. And this inherits all of that functionality. Uh, the best analogy would be to think of this as less of a trackpad that you'd have on um, your laptop and more like a simulated trackball. You know, there's one-to-one -one movement when you remove your thumb across it, so the cursor is very responsive, very precise, but there's also acceleration. So if you flick your thumb across it, it actually acts like a trackball and you can have the cursor fling or have your, your crosshair fling across the screen. And of course, all of that is customizable. Uh, it's also pressure sensitive and there is a little bit of haptic feedback here to get offer the simulation of, of resistance. So it does kind of feel and almost sound like you're rolling a trackball. Uh, I was really happy actually with all of these button placements. The th thumbsticks felt great, uh, definitely felt more like the Xbox joysticks than they do these kind of dinky, drifting uh, switch thumbsticks. They have also capacitive sensors in them, which are useful because you can use that to activate a gyro if you like using gyro controls for aiming. Uh, the ABXY D-pads, really usable. The only thing I didn't particularly like was the combination of using the thumb pads with the default uh, trigger mechanism for uh, pointing and then clicking. So pointing, moving the cursor around, using the thumb pad, no problem. But if I'm in a point and click adventure or playing a puzzle game where I need to drag an object, I need to not only move the mouse cursor, but also be depressing you know, what would be a left click button on a mouse, uh, 
pressing the thumb onto the touchpad as the click uh, oftentimes would also move the cursor in a way that I didn't want it to or didn't expect it to. And so by default, they actually have the shoulder button uh, or you can have uh, a grip button be your left click or your right click. Or you can you know, kind of change that to your A, B, X, Y, one of those buttons be the click. And when gripping the Steam Deck and moving my thumb and then also trying to exert force to press like the shoulder button, that's when I felt like it was the most awkward to hold a button down while also holding the, uh, the whole Steam Deck and then moving my thumb to drag. I feel like that was a little bit of a strain on uh, my thumb, the kind of the, the worst part of the ergonomics here in an otherwise really nice package. Build quality of all this feels really nice as well. And as recently has been shown, iFixit did a teardown of this uh, where they showed these parts are basically very uh, user serviceable. So they'll be supplying uh, replacement parts if needed. It's not too difficult to unscrew and pop open the shell and very easily replace a thing like the joysticks if you end up needing to. Um, and like I said, there is a capacitive sensor on each of these sticks as well. And by Default, if you have a game where you want to use gyro controls for like simulating the mouse or simulating a joystick, uh, like for panning around, you can press your thumb on the joystick and that can activate the gyro. It could be a toggle or it can be a hold to activate. All of that is customizable with the Steam input software. In addition to the haptic feedback that you get on the triggers and the touchpad, there's also rumble support, so haptic support on here, which is uh, also customizable. Um, and it's serviceable, nothing really to write home about. Um, they give appropriate feedback when the game calls for it, but nowhere near the kind of uh, HD haptics that you might see on like the PS5 controller. To round out the hardware, you got power button on the top, there's a USB-C port for charging, as well as for plugging in a dongle if you want to plug in other USB accessories or ethernet or video output. Uh, and you have the fan on top as well as a 3.5 millimeter jack for headphones as well as uh, volume buttons. Uh, there's a micro SD card slot in the bottom. We'll talk about that in a little bit for expandable storage. Uh, and then you have a couple of menu buttons from a Steam button to uh, basically an options button, a uh, overlay button for quick settings, and then a view button which is kind of like a select button on the top left. And using the device at that 1.5 pounds, you know, this was my primary way of holding it. Kind of arms out, elbows on a table or elbows on my knee. Uh, and playing a game for an hour at a time didn't feel all that taxing. Um, there are cases where if I was holding it with one hand and using the other hand to use the touch control, I wouldn't want to do that for long durations, but it's still doable. Uh, but two-handed device, looking straight at it, no problem. Lying on my back and holding it above my head, I couldn't do that for long periods of time. Uh, this is definitely not one of those gaming devices where you want to be kind of holding it up to the ceiling. This is definitely maybe like an elbows on your knees or tucked in uh, form factor for a gaming device. On the back here, there's also uh, intake for the fan that takes air in here and blows it out the top. Uh, and one of the nice things is that this never got hot while playing it. Uh, just the way it's designed, all the thermals and all the processing is right in the back here. So when you're playing it and the fan does kick in relatively quickly and it's noticeable but not annoying, uh, none of the thermals pass through where you're actually holding it. And it never got to a point where it felt too hot to hold. So one of the questions I had going on this was how would this screen hold up, uh, the fidelity of this panel? It's a seven inch panel at 1280 by 800 resolution. That's about 215 pixels per inch. And while that's pretty good compared to a standard laptop or desktop monitor, you're also holding this as a gaming device a little bit closer to your face. Uh, and it's very comparable in terms of the pixel per inch as the OLED switch, uh, which means that it's 
actually really good. Uh, 720p in games looks solid. Now you're gonna notice some jagginess if you don't have anti-aliasing turned on. And text, while perfectly readable, if you do uh, get up close to it, you can see the pixels, you can see a little bit of the smoothing and the dithering uh, in that text. But even you know, running a Chrome web browser, running the Steam OS uh, desktop on this, uh, I was able to fully navigate it on this screen, as well as even playing things like uh, RTS, a real-time strategy game, reading text, reading menus. Uh, it felt like it was still very comfortable at this resolution. Uh, this model of the Steam Deck has a matte panel. Uh, the 64 gig and 256 gig versions have a glossy panel. And while the matte panel allows it to reduce glare in outdoor use, still found that you're gonna look for shade when you're outside. Uh, you're not gonna be able to play this in a really, really bright day. It's gonna look a little bit washed out and certainly not as bright as you know the OLED screens that you've seen on uh, modern phones. Uh, one thing I did notice, I was a little bit disappointed by, uh, with the, is that the black levels are a little bit washed out. Um, color representation is really nice, uh, especially if you're opening, you know, uh, uh, the desktop applications uh, on this. Uh, but the black levels you can see in the menu aren't quite deep enough, and on this unit, I did notice some backlight bleed on the top right, right by where the USB plug uh, is. You can see a little bit of that on the seams, light peeking out. So not sure if that's with this unit or across the other uh, production units, but just be something to look out for. So the bottom sides of the screen are two speakers, so stereo speakers, and the speakers on this actually are pretty great to a point while you can attach and connect Bluetooth headphones or attach a 3.5 millimeter jack and play with headphones on, I ended up doing most of my gaming on this with just the speakers because the sounds were really clear, were crisp, and were full. It was a more not tinny at all in terms of what I was able to hear out of this. And I never felt like I needed to actually max out those speakers either uh, at 50 to 75% uh, speaker sound. Uh, this is more than playable uh, in a normal room with other people talking, other people walking about. Above the screen, there are also two built-in microphones. And so I did some testing of Steam chat uh, conversations, voice chats with the microphone. So here's an example of what that sounds like. And this is what the microphone sounds like being recorded over a Steam voice chat with the Steam Deck being held about standard arm's length as if I was playing a game. The only thing was that when I had the speakers at above 50% and the microphone recording level also above 50%, there was a little bit of crosstalk where on the other line, uh, they could hear themselves coming out of the speakers. Uh, the microphone doesn't do, doesn't do any cancellation or dampening for what's coming out of the speakers. So that might be a reason to use this while with a Bluetooth headphones or uh, with headphones if you're gonna be using the onboard mic. So while I mentioned there are some differences in the various uh, Steam Deck SKUs in terms of like the display, the highest uh, end version has that matte screen as opposed to the glossy screen. Uh, the real differentiating factors is the internal storage. So there are three different models of Steam Deck on offer. At the base level at $400, it's the 64 gigabyte internal storage. Uh, and then there's a 256 gig version and a 512 uh, gigabyte version as well. Uh, the 256 and the 512 gig versions are both NVMe um, SSDs, and all three of them are using an M.2 port, but on the entry level, it's actually an eMMC uh, storage device. Now, with the teardowns that have happened so far that we've seen, it looks like it it's actually possible to replace the internal storage because it just is a standard M.2 port uh, with a drive that's wrapped in uh, some protective shielding. Um, and while we can only speak to the performance and the load times uh, of the uh, NVMe drives, uh, Valve says the eMMC uh, storage will be about 12% slower in games loading and a quarter slower in uh, boot up. And boot up did take a considerable amount of time even on the NVMe 
versions. Um, that may be moot though, because it does have micro SD as a expandable storage option. And one of the things I'm really happy to report is that you can put a large capacity, you can put a terabyte a micro SD card in here and performance is basically going to be about the same uh, whether you're loading a game on the native storage or loading it on the micro SD storage. Yes, there are seconds in di of differences in terms of loading time. So I did load up, for example, GTA 5 on the internal storage as well as moved it over to a few different micro SD cards. And the difference on average was about five seconds uh, in terms of loading. And there was no discernible difference in the actual uh, playing time when I was in game. Uh, now there's a lot of also micro SD card options out there and Valve has only said that this Steam Deck now currently supports USH1 card, so that caps out at 100 megabytes per second reads. Uh, but if you're shopping for a micro SD card, you want one that's high capacity, uh, that won't break the bank, uh, you can look for ones that have uh, a little U3 icon on them, as well as the V30. Those are two classifications, uh, U3 and V30 for a minimum of 30 megabytes per second uh, reads. Uh, you may also see there is like a A classification, either A1 or A2. This is for random reads, um, and which may be useful for open world games. And the price difference between A1 and A2 is, I think, worthwhile enough that you should pick up a high capacity A2 card. So look for uh, the U3 V30 A2 card cards, and I'd say get a minimum of a 512 gigabyte version. Uh, I picked up a few 256 gig versions to test and noticed no big performance difference between like a Sandus or a Lexar, but I did find myself wanting that higher capacity because games these days, some games are, you know, 50 gigs, 100 gigs, and I wanted to store more than just four or five games per SD card. Uh, having a 512 gig one really allows you to have just more game storage. You want to also pick up something like this, like a micro SD card little sleeve, uh, and this fits very nicely in the Steam Deck carrying case as well. Uh, there's also the option to move your storage around. So if you have a game that's on the local storage and you want to not have to download it again, uh, you can move it to a micro SD card or vice versa. But I found that actually moving the games took a pretty long time. Uh, it's not something you can actually have on the background either. In fact, downloading games is actually a little bit CPU intensive. So by default, uh, when you're playing a game, downloads are turned off in the background. Um, but if I, I tried toggling them on and playing a game and games actually had a, quite a bit of a dip in performance, a noticeable dip in performance um, while downloads were happening. We'll wrap up the hardware talk talking about a little bit of connectivity because you can plug in whatever you want into this. There's only one USB-C port and it comes with a 45 watt charger that allows you to charge it while playing. Um, so you're, you can charge the battery. It won't consume more power than it can take in at once. And there's enough juice in this external charger to also run some accessories if you have it connected to uh, a USB-C hub. Uh, Valve does have their own planned dock that's going to be released, which is basically just a stand with a built-in USB-C hub uh, that can have extra USB-A ports as well as display, a display port, an HDMI port, and Ethernet port. But you can buy something that's comparable that maybe won't have the stand functionality built in, like Anker sells USB-C hubs that have Ethernet, have multiple display outs for about 70 to 80 dollars and i really like this amazon basics display uh, to use as a stand because there's no built-in kickstand uh, you can also connect devices wirelessly so you can have your xbox controller your playstation controller connected over bluetooth as well as wireless keyboard and mice and the keyboard and mice also allow you to navigate the uh, main interface as well uh, it's also useful for multiplayer games if you're playing a game with split screen multiplayer one person can be using the steam deck controls while another person can be using a wireless controller or a wired controller or both of you can be using external controllers. It has multiple device inputs seamlessly supported.
All right, let's talk about the deck interface because it's actually kind of a big deal, not only for people using the Steam Deck, of course, uh, but for any Steam user, especially if you currently uh, are a user of the big picture mode, that full screen mode uh, that Valve put out to play Steam on big TVs or your laptop or desktop to fill up that entire screen because this deck UI will be eventually replacing that. And one of the things I want to caveat is how quickly this has been changing. Even over the past couple days, uh, Valve has been sending updates, some of which has really radically affected not only the options that are available in some of the menus, but the way some of these menus are presented. So by the time you, you watch this, a lot of what you see on screen here may have changed, may have been tweaked, and it speaks to how fast Valve has been iterating and refining this deck UI and how much there still may be yet to come as they customize and respond to the user feedback. Uh, but a lot of this interface visually reminds me of uh, the Steam interface on desktop, the thing they updated and uh, did a revamp of uh, a couple of years ago. So it has that kind of you know, flat gray background, games in your library are uh, not in a list, but they're represented in these uh, graphical icons, these rectangular boxes. Uh, and then you can tap into things like the Steam Store, which is just the, the web browser version. Much like in the Steam Desktop, you know, you click the store, and it's really loading the website and the web page for you to browse games and buy games, uh, the biggest kind of uh, interface, uh, noticeable interface difference here uh, come in from the sides. So on the left side here, there's a Steam button, and you press the Steam button, and a menu pops in. This is an overlay, the Steam overlay, the equivalent of the Steam overlay on desktop, but for mobile, and it can be popped up in-game, uh, a version of this pops up in-game or whatever application you're running. So you can use this to quit the game, you can use this to, in any game to pause it and jump back into the main uh, menu for a little bit of light multitasking or tap into you know, your home screen, your library, the store, settings, and all the main kind of customization options, controller options that you might need quick access to. That comes in from the left side. On the right side, there's this quick uh, preference menu. And here's where you get access to notifications, your friends list, a really all important performance menu, as well as uh, just a standard menu to change you know, your brightness, your quick access to speaker and microphone, uh, as well as check your uh, battery life. Um, this kind of quick settings menu, uh, airplane mode, Wi-Fi, that's all here. And this again is also an interface that you can, uh, an overlay that you can activate regardless of what application or game you're in. These things run into the background, they're built into that Steam UI. And one of the most important things about the UI uh, is the Steam input shortcut. So whether you're on a game's landing page uh, or you're actually in the game itself, if you hit the Steam button, not only can you, uh, you know, quit the game, force quit it, you can immediately access and see a visualization of the Steam input uh, presets and the controller buttons and what each button does in your current configuration. And here is where Valve is tapping into this vast library of user-generated and uh, voted on configurations. And anyone who's used a gamepad on SteamOS and has used recommend, user-recommended configurations will find it familiar here, where you can create your own profiles, uh, you can adjust everything from the kind of what each button does to the granularity of the responsiveness of the touch pads to the dead zones on the joystick, um, all of that and saved as a preset to share or to uh, download uh, what other people have uploaded to then tweak and make your own. It's one of the most powerful aspects of Steam and uh, they've brought that very logically into the deck UI front and center. The other thing that's new about the deck UI that they've built in natively is the ability to suspend games, to pause games, kind of a necessary feature, a game that, or a feature that you would really expect out of a handheld gaming device. So if you're in the game, uh, in any game, you, or in any application, or even just in the main menu, hitting that power button doesn't turn the device off. It just puts it in a suspended state. Um, and you, whether you're paused or not paused, 
in the game. You can literally press it, the screen will go off, and if you press the button again, immediately, half a day later, a couple days later, uh, it will actually immediately boot back up into where you were. It's not going to reload any assets. You're not going to get pop in. It actually just brings you back to exactly the state that the game was in, uh, and Wi-Fi gets reconnected. So if it's a game that requires um, streaming assets online or requires authentication, you get that pretty quickly as well. Uh, there's a little bit of vampire battery drain when that's happening because uh, memory does require power to cycle through. So in my testing, uh, a, a game pause in suspend mode for about eight hours took down about 5% of battery life. So I'm not gonna leave this in a drawer uh, with a game in mid suspend for you know two weeks or so, uh, but for a day to come back with or playing a game at night and coming back the next night and not plugging that in, no problem. Uh, and then you can still, of course, plug in to charge up and top off. You know, one thing we haven't talked about, and it's interesting that we haven't talked about it yet, is compatibility. And it was one of the biggest questions going into uh, after the announcement of the Steam Deck, because we all saw one of the, the failings of the Steam Machines initiative was that Valve, with the early versions of Steam OS, didn't have enough compatibility and support for just a wide swath of the tens of thousands of PC games that they sell in their store. So since Steam Machines, Valve has been working on Proton, which is a compatibility layer, uh, not an emulator, that basically um, reverse engineers the, the graphics calls and the API calls that a game needs and would it normally expect out of a Windows installation uh, so that you can run it on uh, their version of, or any version of Linux. And the advances they've made in Proton over the past, uh, not just past couple years, but even over the last six months, has been really impressive to a point where Valve has been independently on their own running verification uh, across their library. And as of right now, close to a thousand games are verified as playable on the Steam Deck. You'll see these green checkboxes and there's a specific section of the store in the library that says plays great on deck. And when it says plays great on deck, that experience of playing those games, whether it's a legacy game or a modern game, is almost as seamless as launching a game on a Windows version of Steam. You're pressing play, the game launches, you might see a little bit of a front end, a launcher that you might need to you know, click uh, using a cursor or click OK, or at most, maybe type in using the virtual keyboard, uh, a login or your name. But for the most part, I was really impressed and really amazed um, uh, by how many games I cared about and were in my Steam library that work right out of the box. There were instances where you know a game would launch and I would see some offsetting of the UI to not be fully compatible with the screen resolution or see peeks through the back end, the ways that uh, they're tricking uh, the game into thinking it's running um, on its native, uh, on Windows. But for the most part, you'll see a little bit of uh, text on the bottom of the screen uh, as it's loading for the first time. It'll create some Proton files, uh, and the games kind of just work. Uh, Proton, you can even select the different uh, versions of it in the menu, so the latest experimental builds for uh, the best compatibility. Uh, and even games that were just released, Elden Ring, for example, has been Steam verified. Uh, from what I've been told, there are hundreds of these units out in the hands of developers to test for compatibility so that developers can push out uh, updates or even in the future, uh, special versions and packages of their game that can be optimized to maybe take up less storage uh, or have different UI, um, UI elements or interfaces to be optimized for this display and uh, to recognize that it's being played on a Steam Deck so everything works just out of the box. It was this big question of not only how many games would be supported on the Steam Deck in the Steam Library, but what that onboarding would be like, how transparent or how kind of opaque uh, the compatibility layer would be. And it really, at this point, is almost an afterthought. I mean, there are going to be games that 
are resistant to being on this platform. With games that, for example, Epic uh, owns and develops, uh, they've said that they're not going to have native Steam Deck compatibility. Uh, but you know, the good thing is that you can actually bypass all that if you want to install Windows on this and boot directly into Windows and run it as a Windows PC. You might take some performance hit near and there. You won't get the benefits of you know their uh, their suspend feature or the, the the overlays with these dedicated hardware buttons. Um, but the idea that you can run emulators, you can run Windows applications on this, uh, in addition to the compatibility uh, that they've supported now with the latest version of Proton, um, makes compatibility as a whole uh, not a big concern. The bigger question then becomes of performance, because once you get these games launched, uh, how do those games perform using this APU with this target resolution uh, and what settings? So one of the ways you can think about it, and maybe a way, to, a convenient way to categorize generations of games, is kind of to look to console generations. I know this is a PC gaming device, and there is a whole library of PC games that far extend beyond you know, modern consoles. But if you think of console games, maybe uh, the Xbox 360 slash PS3 era as one generation of games. I loaded a bunch of those up, so things like Bioshock Infinite, you know, TF2, for example, those games run perfectly. Uh, performance-wise, 60 hertz, no problem, graphics maxed out, anti-aliasing on, um, no stuttering, loads really quickly, um, no problem whatsoever in terms of performance. Moving up to games of the last generation, so the Xbox Series One as well as PS4 games. So we're talking more like you know GTA V, uh, Titanfall 2, the Arkham games. Uh, those surprisingly, and surprising to me, also ran extremely well. Uh, a game like Titanfall 2, for example, kind of right in the core of uh, the Xbox One generation, that ran max graphic settings, anti-aliasing on, at this 1280 by 800 resolution, at 60 frames a second. A perfect experience on the Steam Deck. GTA 5, where you can configure a lot in terms of view distance, post-processing, anti-aliasing. Also, high slash ultra detail, no problem. You got about between 30 and 45 frames per second. A game like Red Dead Redemption, which I did not expect to be able to run on this natively, uh, also ran fine with graphics more in the medium to high settings. And that's where one where anti-aliasing took was a big uh, took a big performance hit with A turned on, but so I used FXAA, which was less of a performance hit, which I felt was also necessary because it's a game where you could see a lot of aliasing in you know the foliage in the environment. So I would want that turned on. And then when you're talking about the latest generation of games, so you know your Elden Rings to God of War just released on PC recently to things like Cyberpunk, that's where while the games technically run, uh, it, you're going to be stuck to low to medium settings at this native resolution. God of War medium settings did maintain about 30 frames per second, um, but it did feel a little bit like a compromise experience if you're used to that game on a high-end gaming PC or even on your PS4. And not that you could make direct apples to apples comparison between the Steam Deck at a $400 price point with a performance of a high-end gaming PC, but as a point of reference, that's you know if you're looking to spend money to play games and uh, you don't want to compromise on quality, uh, that's where you may, might want to make the decision to uh, spend more money on a high-end graphics card and play on a dedicated gaming laptop or desktop PC or even on a game console as opposed to playing those latest and greatest current generation games uh, maxed out on a device like this. Uh, now, because this is Steam and it not only works in, in the Steam ecosystem, it also works with Steam Remote Play. And this is something that, you know, if you're kind of curious about what playing PC games on the couch is like, well, you can kind of do that now. Uh, not only with what Valve had released with the Steam Link, but the Steam Link applications on your iPhone. You can stream right now from your desktop or laptop 
Steam games on a local network uh, to your phone, and you can buy things like this, you know, Razer Kishi controller to plug in to get a okay gaming, a handheld gaming experience. Uh, and in fact, you can play remote play on this device using it as a client for those games as well, which is what I ended up doing on some games like Cyberpunk. I played Halo Cyberpunk not natively on the device, but did it off of my desktop gaming PC on my local network where I could uh, render that out at 4K or 1080p resolution, have it downsampled here for just maxed out graphics. Uh, you can also use this Steam Deck as a host for remote play. So if you want it for some reason to have this plugged in and docked and then stream a game off of this to a phone, you technically can, although I never found that to be a real practical application of this, especially if you have an alternative like uh, a gaming PC running Steam already. With that performance though, let's talk about battery life because there's a 40 watt hour battery in here. And one of the most interesting things about the Steam Deck is how transparent they make the power consumption and how that kind of affected almost the way I played the games. So at a, at a base level, a AAA game that taxes the uh, the APU that's making the most out of the graphics the graphical power of this you'll hear the fan spin on it's using up to that 25 watts 15 watts on the uh, APU side plus additional uh, power consumption on the screen and controller and memory and Wi-Fi of course uh, I was only able to get an hour and a half of real game time. Sometimes it would say like two hours. You can see actually a uh, battery indicator. Uh, you can toggle that on in the top left-hand corner of the screen. And it would say you have about two hours of play time here. But really at about an hour, hour and a half of play time, it was getting to a point where I felt like I wanted to plug this in or change up my configuration options. And what's interesting is with that top left menu, there's this transparency into the exact power consumption. Uh, and if you think about a 40 watt hour battery and device that consumes at max, let's say 20 watts of power, that's 20 watts of power, a 40 watt hour battery, that's two hours of use time. And so you can really actually do the direct math and know that if you're playing a 2D game that's sprite-based, that's not power or graphically intensive, and it's only using you know, five watts of graphics, you can actually extrapolate in real time in your head approximately how much power and how much battery life you're gonna get out of this. Now, I was never able to get a full eight hours of use, uh, even with my brightness at half uh, and my frame rate capped at 30 frames per second. I was mostly topping out at about the five hours of use, and that's doing some you know, web browsing, kind of just watching videos on this, or game streaming. Um, and I know people have pushed the limits of this to try to get that up to eight hours, but I think that's really uh, diminishing the quality of experience. This is the device that, you're, that most games think of it as two to three hours for a modern high-end graphics game, uh, but with some tweaks, you get about four to five hours of use or if you're doing remote play. And by tweaks, I mean that in the quick settings menu here, if you go to the performance tab, you can actually change a lot. Not only do you can you put in the overlay to see how much power is being consumed, you can do a couple things. You can cap the frame rate. So one of the things is that in the latest build of SteamOS, they've capped the frame rate at 60 hertz, although I think later on they'll allow uh, higher frame rates if you want to plug this to an external monitor. Uh, but you can toggle a frame rate cap to 30 hertz. So effectively, uh, if you can use almost half the power necessary to run that game if it's hitting at load. Instant boost to battery life, although I did notice the visual differences, the experiential differences between 30 hertz and 60 hertz pretty noticeably in, um, in a lot of games. You can also cap just power consumption. Really interesting. You can toggle that on and say, you know, my 15 watt max normally for the, the APU, I'm going to drag that all the way down to 5 watts or even at the lowest 3 watts. And there are some games that play okay at 3 watts of power consumption and that's a fifth of the max power. Now you're not going to be able to run your God of War at 3 watts and on it, the, the game doesn't work 
at all there, uh, but it is a way for you to artificially cap that uh, power consumption. Or even if you want, you can also cap the, uh, the frequency of your GPU and say, I want to only run this at 200 megahertz uh, and really cap the performance, cap the power consumption, and extend that battery life. Uh, what's not unlocked, though, is any ability to, to overclock this, to increase the power consumption, increase the clock speed. Uh, and Valve has said, based on their thermal design, based on the kind of performance per watt uh, curve of this APU, it really hits that sweet spot around 11 to 12 watts. Uh, and even going to 15 watts, you're getting diminishing returns per watt. Now, that's not to say there are going to be folks out there who don't want to overclock, and people certainly will want to be able to overclock, so we'll see what valve might unlock in the future. And when you've drained that battery uh, to recharge it, that 45 watt charger actually does have a nice fast charge. So at about an hour and a half of charging, you can get this topped off about three quarters full. Although that last 25% or so did take well over an hour to hit that 100% mark. And if you leave this plugged in uh, overnight, it will do a little bit of power management. It will allow that lithium ion battery to do a little bit of draining uh, just to keep the, the health of it going. Because like your phone batteries, uh, the batteries are kind of consumable. They have a limited a number of recharge cycles. Uh, and based on that iFixit teardown, we did see while the battery is removable, it is super, it is glued, hot glued into the chassis. Uh, and so you definitely don't want to get to a point where you're killing the lifespan of the battery by overcharging it. Now that USB-C port you use for charging is also where you would plug in a hub to add extra accessories or output to additional uh, monitors uh, if you're using this in desktop mode, for example. And you plug, you can plug this into a TV and have it kind of like your Switch uh, HDMI dock and play games on a big screen. Although the experience wasn't as great as I'd hoped. Your games are still capped at 1280 by 800 resolution. Uh, and while the deck UI scales up so you can see more icons, to uh, if you plug this up to you know, a 4K display, I found that upscaling that UI to a 4K display uh, was really uh, performance intensive. So there, the, the UI wasn't res responsive on my big screen TV, and there was no way to calibrate or adjust that big screen mode uh, so that I could maybe output a 1080p signal to a 4K display. And even playing games at 1280 by 800 on a big screen TV, the scaling, there was some uh, built-in scaling options. You can do standard integer-based scaling. You can do the AMD FSR-based scaling it didn't look as good as I had hoped. It did still look like you know, a lower resolution 720p game scaled up to a large TV. This does not, I think, replace having an Xbox or a PlayStation or even a Steam Link device. Uh, this it would be better to have something streamed from a desktop gaming PC to a big screen TV than playing natively on the Steam Deck and then sent through HDMI to your big TV. The AMD FSR upscaling is also a feature that theoretically allows for games to perform better, for you to get better performance out of games if you force them to render at a lower resolution. Uh, but one of the things I found is that most modern games don't let you adjust lower than 720p. So because of the way Steam Deck is telling those games through Proton what its monitor is and what its display is, uh, when I'm in those menus and I'm in a modern game that's graphically intensive and I want to take advantage of the FSR upscaling to get better frame rates out of that, uh, it just simply did not have that option to render at lower than 720p and get upscaling. So that might be a thing that changes as developers can tune their games to the Steam Deck, but as of right now, SFR isn't giving me the kind of performance benefits I had hoped, um, and the upscaling that it does provide on a big screen TV I found to be kind of unremarkable and not, not that impressive. Okay, so I keep on saying that the Steam Deck is basically a gaming PC, and the PC part of that shouldn't be dismissed as well, because while there is this Deck UI that has a very seamless and user-friendly and almost console-like game experience, you could also use this literally 
like you would a laptop or a desktop computer. And what's surprising is that Valve has made accessing the SteamOS 3 Linux desktop interface as simple as going to the power button and saying switching to the desktop mode. It's a kind of a, a toggle. It reboots the system and launches it into the desktop mode. And what may be surprising is that this the deck UI, the, the gaming mode, the game interface, isn't a traditional overlay. It, it's not like minimized or anything on top of Linux. It's actually running as a separate instance of the desktop. So when you do boot it into SteamOS 3, into Linux, and it's using the KDE Plasma interface, it looks like a traditional desktop. If you have a mouse and you have a keyboard connected wirelessly or wired, you can actually use on this seven inch screen a web browser and you can open up and install packages. And even if you don't have any Linux experience, like it's been a while since I have used the Linux desktop, certainly not as a daily driver, I was really surprised at how user-friendly the Plasma interface is. There's no need to go into the terminal to, to download and find packages. You can just click the Discover uh, interface and sort and browse and one-click install, you know, things like uh, Discord, Slack, Spotify, Chrome browser, and literally run that uh, in addition to uh, any number of applications uh, that are released out on Linux right now. And in fact, one of the Interesting and weirdest things as, is that within the Steam OS desktop, you can also launch Steam. <laughs> you can actually launch Steam as you would if you had Steam OS uh, plugged into or installed on a, a desktop computer and you get a traditional big picture mode. That's the interface that's not this Deck UI interface, uh, which I'm sure will be updated uh, once Deck UI propagates and replaces big picture mode. Um, but it's in that Steam OS 3 version of Steam big picture mode uh, where you can then output and do uh, gaming at higher resolutions. And you can plug in monitors and have multi-monitor support uh, where you're displaying or mirroring what's on the screen here along with what's on a 4K display or a 1080 display or up to two uh, 4K panels because it does support DisplayPort uh, 1.4 with the compression for outputting. Uh, to multi-monitors. Uh, and the performance isn't exactly the same. You do lose things like the suspend and the interface, uh, but it's just another way to show that Valve is opening up the Steam OS and opening up uh, different ways of running Steam, running games, and running software on the deck. Now, Windows is this big elephant in the room because with Proton compatibility, with the user friendliness, honestly, of uh, Steam OS, I didn't really feel a need to install Windows. And honestly, that's one of the things I didn't get a chance to do for multiple reasons. Right now, Windows doesn't support a dual boot with an existing Linux install. So to get Windows in here, definitely possible, but you have to install Windows first and then re-image SteamOS onto the deck as a secondary boot option. Uh, also, as of right now, with launch time, uh, there are no AMD graphics drivers for this custom chip for Windows, and so we aren't really able to do any performance testing. Uh, most we could do is try traditional Windows applications, uh, but that Zen 2 CPU has been well tested and benchmark in the PC review space. And it really is comparable. It's like an entry or mid-tier um, PC or laptop that you could buy today. So it's not something I would expect to be running, you know, Adobe Premiere and heavy video edits or, um, you know, um, a large computing tasks on, uh, but if you end up installing Windows on here, the expectation is that you are gonna be able to, you know, run applications like Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever your suite applications if you really want to, in addition to the Epic Game Store if you want to run those games. And speaking of uh, other platforms, there's also obviously cloud gaming as well, uh, you know, with xCloud in a browser, and uh, that's going to work. But right now, I think Valve is working through a controller issue, uh, which has not been resolved yet as of my recording of this, for the controllers to be recognized uh, in cloud streaming games. So something to be tested in the future. 
Uh, there is multitasking um, when you're in the deck UI. So if, for example, you download Spotify or Discord and you want to access those applications while you're in the deck UI in a game, uh, you can actually add it in Steam, in the SteamOS 3 uh, as a non-game, and then it will show up under a, uh, a listing uh, in the deck UI the next time you boot that up. So if you're in the middle of a game and you press the Steam button, you can actually then, uh, it'll show the other applications. You can launch uh, Chrome, you can launch Discord, you can launch Slack, and you can have those running in the background. And there's enough um, processing in here to run games and give you some overhead to do those other applications uh, simultaneously as well. That is a new feature that they just updated with the recent update. Like I said, updates are coming super fast and furious. I want to wrap things up because there is so much to cover and there's so much to uncover and things are certainly going to be changing as these units start hitting consumers in the coming weeks and months. But the big questions that we had when we first heard about the Steam Deck have, I think, largely been answered. Performance-wise, I think Valve absolutely hit the mark with running modern games and certainly games of that Xbox One slash PS4 era at well above 30 frames per second at high graphics settings. Uh, if you have a library of games that you never got to, that you bought during a Steam sale, this feels like the perfect device to pick up to play those games so you're not tethered to your desktop or your laptop and you can play in the bed or on a couch or in the bathroom if you really wanted to. Performance really impressed me there, uh, what AMD was able to do with Valve in their collaboration. Ergonomics and form factor, yeah, it's it's a big device, and at 1.5 pounds, I think it reaches kind of the limits of, of long-term comfort, but I think it's also paired with that battery life of, you know, how long these game sessions end up being. And I never found myself playing for more than two hours at a time on this. Most of my game sessions, honestly, were in 45 minutes to an hour, uh, at which point I felt like it was a good time to take a break, plug it in, and do something else. If you're traveling, if you're on an airplane, if you're on a long train ride and you really need more than two hours, having those extra configuration options to change the, the, the cap, the uh, GPU use, usage, uh, max out the clock speeds, or cut the frame rate in half. All of those things can extend battery life. Um, but I think they did a good job balancing the ergonomics and they all the, the comfort of the inputs, the versatility of the inputs. This was way more fun to hold and use than the dinky the buttons of, uh, of a Nintendo Switch um, to a point where I didn't feel like I need to use the Xbox controller or a third-party controller. I was just happy to have this in my hand playing for those hour-long sessions. And then compatibility, I think that is a question that's really, they, they knock that out of the park as well, really well answered. And for the Steam Deck, it's less of a question about game compatibility and what Proton can do, and more about hardware availability, honestly. Because for you out there watching, this review today, if you haven't made a decision about whether to pick up a Steam Deck or you didn't know about it and you're interested in it, the earliest you're gonna be able to get this if you pre-order today is gonna to be the second half this year or who knows, right now the pre-order's backed up to after Q2 2022. And we just don't know, that's the one thing that Valve has not been able to, to answer is what the supply looks like. Once this gets into enough people's hands, if it becomes as popular as Valve hopes, uh, one of the interesting things that this does is that it creates a standardized platform for people to share configurations, where no longer are you diving into forums and wondering, you know, what settings should I set my game and tweak it for this performance because everyone's going to have a different motherboard, graphics card, monitor, display input. Uh, 
with the Steam Deck, you have, like with Steam Input, a way potentially for people to share and for developers to really optimize their games in a very console-like way for the PC platform uh, so that people are going to, over time, find the best ways to run their game uh, on this device. It's something that typically we, we haven't had in the console space uh, because those aren't as customizable and configurable, and we haven't had it in the the, the core PC space because of the variance in, uh, in configura uh, configurations. And Valve is opening this platform up to other hardware makers as well. Uh, that's a big question as to whether those makers, whether it's GPD, Aya, or Razer, uh, HP Dell, traditional OEM PC makers want to make handhelds using what's available, what Valve is now proven to be possible with this form factor, with the, the processors out there, uh, and now they're kind of available, publicly available uh, uh, operating system, not having to pay a Windows license fee is a money savings, is a big deal. Um, but I don't know if those hardware manufacturers will be able to hit the price point that Valve has launch this at because that's the biggest biggest advantage of the Steam Deck and is that Valve's aggressive $400 pricing to get this as a compelling offer uh, into the marketplace feels honestly kind of unnecessary. I think if this was, this is a device that's easily worth twice what Valve is charging for it and this could have been a $500 device and I think it would be just as successful and popular because of how much is over and exceeded uh, my expectations and I think the expectations of gamers out there. But we'll take it. We'll take having this as a $400 price point. Um, Valve has said they're working on thinking about future versions of the Steam Deck and I can't imagine in the future they'll do this subsidization again and have and keep at a $400 price point. I would love to see them uh, go bolder with things like an OLED screen. Uh, even if their target performance is 720p and they keep that, I would love to see a 1080p screen here just for the remote play so I can stream games at 1080 from uh, a desktop gaming PC and I'd be happy to pay a premium for those features. And like I said, this year, for the Steam Deck, uh, if not for mass availability, may be the year that we'll see kind of a, more of a refinement of Steam as a platform on the software side as well. There are plenty of features uh, I'm sure they're working on that I would love to see on the Steam Deck. Uh, for example, uh, like a low power mode where if I have this docked and plugged in, I can do background downloads um, without the screen being on. It doesn't time out um, like, it, like you do on a, a laptop or a, a desktop. Um, things like that, things that we kind of take for granted in the, the console space, I feel like some of those features, they can still add and improve. And customization, skinning the UI, not just the keyboard, things that I'm sure will uh, come and that Steam Deck users can be excited for. And most of all, this feels like the beginning of something. It feels like the beginning of something new. Maybe not like the next stage of PC gaming, but another facet, another use case for PC gaming that we we haven't had before. We've seen a lot of you know indie hardware makers attempt to make uh, portable gaming devices, you know, running Android, using what was the latest you know ARM hardware at the time. The Ouya comes to mind uh, in terms of something for the the, the set top for the living room. Uh, but new hardware has often come with um, a chicken and egg. Uh, conundrum where hardware makers try to get something out there to, to build a, an ecosystem of users so that developers are incentivized to develop. Uh, here, that chicken and egg problem is solved at the offset because the software is there already. The Steam library that you may have purchased already come ready to run with compatibility increasing uh, on a weekly basis. And that combined with the performance and that price point uh, make this just one of the best devices I've used in 
a long time. But I've done enough talking. Thank you so much for spending this time listening to me ramble on about my experiences and my testing of the Steam Deck. Uh, it's just really one of the most exciting pieces of PC hardware I've used in years. And I can't wait till more people get their hands on it so we can start sharing our configurations and tweaks and celebrating PC gaming in a new way. Uh, if you have questions, more questions about this, uh, please post them in the comments below. But until next time, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for watching again, and I'll see you next time. Bye.